This is the third in a series on the game theory of bullying. And in my first two videos, I modeled different games which represented different moments in the friendship. And all of these are about a fifth grade schoolyard bullying situation. This video is really wrapping up this series and I'm not going to go over in detail how you construct the specific payoffs in each of these boxes. I've done a lot of that in the previous two videos. Really, what I'm doing in this video is going to be giving you an outline of how do you think about solving this problem if you're an adult on a group of parents who are worried about some of this. And I'm also gonna be talking about what are some ways to reframe the problem to capture different situations that we see in the fifth grade schoolyard. Let's take a look at the specific payoffs and briefly how did I construct these payoffs. I basically said which box is best for the bully. Well the bully likes to bully and have everybody continue to stay friends with them. And the lowest payoff for the bully in this table is going to be when the friend drops the friendship and they haven't even bullied. That means there's something else about them that's not the bullying that uh, people don't like and that, that feels kind of bad. If people drop the friendship and you've been bullying, at least you kind of understand why they did that. And of course the baseline happiness in the friendship for all friends, if the bully does not bully, is going to be five and five. Now the payoffs for the friends, of course, are going to be worst payoff is when the bully bullies. You don't like to stay friends with them. Now the best payoff for the friend is going to be this payoff, which is just the baseline situation where nobody in the group bullies and you get to have a more long-standing friendship. Um, I put a payoff of three over here because it's still a positive friendship. You just drop the bully as a friend, you find a new friend group when there's a convenient time to do that, such as the change in a school year. Um, but your friend group isn't as long-standing as it would be if nobody in the group was bullying and you just stayed friends. So that's th that's those payoffs. Let's let's look at the Nash equilibrium here. All right, we can see the Nash equilibrium is where the bully bullies. As a matter of fact, for this bully, depending on their um, payoffs, we have a dominant strategy of bullying. And of course, we're going to want to change um, the payoffs for the bully if we're adults looking at the situation. Now the Nash equilibrium over here is what we actually observe. It's where the bully bullies and people drop the friendship even if they go along in the moment and don't confront, they eventually just drop the friendship. So we observe this behavior, let's say we're a parent group and we're observing this equilibrium and all the parents are upset. In which case, what can we do? And the trick when you're analyzing policy using game theory is to figure out, okay, wait, what's the smallest number of changes I could make in the payoff table here that would change the equilibrium to something better? And once you've identified a small number of changes to the payoffs, you're going to start to think about, well, let's think about all of the psychological reasons behind these payoffs and which ones we can actually influence as parents. No, I will admit the other two games are probably a better place to start if you're in a parent group that's worried about bullying, but this is my last video in the series, so I'm really um, analyzing this game at the moment. Um, you could do the same thing with the other two games. Now here I recognize, okay, I really don't like that the bully's dominant strategy is to bully. As a matter of fact, the bully should recognize that, wait a second, I'm actually better off in the long run down here by not bullying than I am up here. So if, if somehow we could actually change the bully's dominant strategy such that there was a situation where they didn't bully, they could see the longer run, that would change the table. So we might start to think about how could we actually change these payoffs. Right now, with these payoffs, the bully thinks they're better off bullying. But that's actually because they don't see this equilibrium coming. They don't predict that their friends are going to drop them. And if it's the fifth grade, maybe they've been a bully for a couple years and maybe they've even observed this, but they, they just don't have the insight to see, oh wait, it's my behavior that's leading people to not want to rekindle the friendship the next year when friend groups mix up. So that could be one solution, is to sort of help the bully see how their behavior is contributing to their friends dropping them. And if you can get the bully to see that, that would actually change this one to negative five because the bully knows, okay, I may be getting a utility of 15 if I bully and people stay friends for now, but the pattern that I've observed is that I lose friends in the long run and end up without as many friends in the long run. So if they can recognize that actually 
The payoff here is negative five. When you think of it in a little longer run terms, that's going to change the Nash equilibrium. And now you have two Nash equilibriums, but there's one Nash equilibrium that dominates the other. Both players get a higher payoff down here. So just by making that one change, actually it's just one little box change, um, I changed the entire equilibrium of the, of the game. Now, of course, you have to ask the question, can you actually convince the bully that if they bully now, even if they feel top of the pecking order right now, that they are going to lose friends in the long run? That might be a challenge. So you have to evaluate the feasibility of every payoff change that you, you're trying to make if you're changing policy. But that's the general approach to policies. You look at a game and you say, how can I change the equilibrium without changing too many of the payoffs? Because we know that payoffs are hard to change. It's going to take a lot of investment on the part of the parents and the teachers and maybe the psychologists on campus. There's a lot of resources that are going to go into changing any one of these payoffs. So minimizing the number of these that you change is going to be key. Another thing I would like to point out here is that if we look at the entire three-part game, we can see that there's a hero and a villain in this game. Um, the, the hero is the person who's willing to stand up for the victim of the bullying. And really, we should be encouraging all of our kids to be that person. If someone in your group is bullying another member of the group or someone in a different group, doesn't matter what kid on the schoolyard is being bullied, if you can be the one to stand up to that and say, hey, we don't do that, we don't treat people like that in this group, and if you can get people to go along with you, that's a really good long run outcome. Just having one person willing to do that and another group of people in the group who are willing to support that, even if they're a little bit afraid of the bully, that is another approach to changing the payoffs in this game to get a much better equilibrium. As a matter of fact, the hero in this game actually has the very highest status in the group. Because if you can stand up to the bully and have people in your group support you, then you've actually set yourself up as a leader in the group. And that's a true leader. As a matter of fact, that's what we want from our leaders in the workplace. In all domains as adults, we want our leaders to be that kind of person. We want people with courage, people with integrity, people who, who are going to ensure that people in the group don't peck on each other, don't bully each other. That's what we want as an adult. <clears throat> so if that's what we want as adults in our leaders, we can start training our leaders when they're in the fifth grade. So what's the weird part here? The weird part is if we think about the personality traits that might lead to a bully, this might be the kind of personality who cares a lot about pecking order and wants to be the top of their group. So the question is, if the adults are trying to get this outcome where nobody bullies, how do you get to the top of the group? And a bully might actually look at this game and look at the payoffs and say, actually, the role I want to be in is the role of a hero. On one hand, this is really good. As a matter of fact, I remember reading a quote somewhere, and I can't remember where I read this, but it said, you cannot make a bully into a wallflower, but you can make a bully into a knight. I think it was a knight into a defender of the victim. And that seems like a really good approach is that if adults recognize someone who has a bit of a bully personality, can you change that so that they're not just picking on people such that they're, they're using that will to power, if you use Nietzsche's terms, that you use that will to power for good. You use that will to power to enforce good social norms in the group. That could be a way of changing the bully's payoffs if you give them a healthier way of enacting their leadership skills. Now, the problem here, of course, is what if the bully is in a group where there aren't that many things to enforce? So there's not another bully that you can sort of stand up to when they try to bully. One thing that can happen in this situation is that the bully can, can essentially use values as a way of picking on other people. Now, one thing about these roles here is that you can get a situation where someone acts as the defender of the victim, they act as the person living out their values, but they're kind of doing it mostly to raise their status in the pecking order in the group. As a matter of fact, they could sort of look around carefully for opportunities to put someone in their place if someone's sort of falling out of line um, according to the social values of the group. So 
In this exercise, I've, I've made a clear distinction between the bully and the defender of the victim. As a matter of fact, those look like really the hero and the villain in the game. But I just want to acknowledge that a really clever bully can set themselves up as the defender of the victim, or maybe it's not even something with a clear victim, maybe it's just sort of the defender of the values of the group, and they're the enforcer of those social norms, which can be viewed as good, even sometimes by members of the group, but its real purpose is to sort of peck on other people. So I, I just want to acknowledge that that can happen and that these games are way, way more complex than I've set up here. This is really just trying to get you to think about how can we construct games if, we, if we're parents and we want to change an outcome. And the same analysis here can be used in many, many policy situations. So I think that's all I have to say here. I hope you found this helpful in thinking through how do you approach a real world problem by constructing your own payoffs? And how do you change the outcome of that problem by sort of redoing the payoffs or trying to influence the payoffs in some way.